world uh, recognized was that there were people in the United States who were willing to use violence to try to block the uh, uh, democratic transfer of power, which is something that we have pretty much assumed there for uh, some time now, and um, that I think most of you all assume would happen here. And in most of our democracies in uh, um, uh, this part of the world, uh, we've sort of assumed for a while that uh, we kind of had this down. We didn't always like how it turned out, uh, weren't always um, uh, happy with the results of elections, but that uh, the nonviolent transfer of power would happen, uh, at least in my lifetime in the places where I've lived, has been fairly well assumed. Uh, that was not the case on January the 6th, and as has now come out in many trials, which have led to people being sentenced to, I think, up to 16 years in prison is the longest sentence someone's gotten so far, um, there were many people who were willing to uh, attack law enforcement officers and break into a building to try to stop a process uh, that, that was about certifying the 2020 election in the United States. Well, as that was happening, uh, there's a historian at our uh, National um, Institute of Museums, it's called the Smithsonian in the United States, there's a, a religious historian there who began documenting the uh, cultural artifacts of religion that were part of that siege. He started calling it Capital Siege Religion. And even as it was happening, he, he began to, uh, to note that there were Christian flags flying out on the lawn, that there were people wearing t-shirts that had scriptures emblazoned on them, that there was qu quite a bit of sort of uh, religious activity uh, involved. I don't know if any of you saw this video. There was a uh, a version of it that the New Yorker published after the fact, but there was a, a man who called himself a shaman. Uh, he was rather distinctive, wore horns on his head and such, who made his way uh, after, uh, I think as his trial showed, after um, assaulting some people and breaking into the building, uh, he made his way into the uh, Senate chamber, so where the Senate meets regularly, and went up on the dais at the front, and uh, when he sort of took control of the room, although there wasn't anyone really stopping him at that point, um, uh, he called the attention of the room uh, and uh, offered a prayer. And uh, you might go online and watch it sometime uh, if you haven't seen it, because um, strange as his appearance is, if you closed your eyes and just listened to the prayer, the vocabulary he was using the cadence of the prayer, the sort of, sort of general way of addressing God that uh, he took up when he began to give thanks to God that he had been allowed to make it to this place and to uh, resist this transfer of power in the United States um, was very familiar. Uh, would, would, would probably uh, be language much like you've heard in churches where you have worshiped. Um, uh, if your Baptist church is here or like other Baptist churches I've visited, around the world. It was a very evangelical sounding prayer. And all of this, this historian was noting because he just thought it was important to document the role that religion seemed to be playing in this event. Well, it turns out that sociologists for some time have been paying attention to the kinds of uh, narratives that led people to believe the stories that were told about uh, the 2020 election and, uh, that were th and the, the networks that brought people to that event in D.C. on January 6th. Um, these sociologists uh, survey the American public regularly, and uh, they came up with a battery of questions some time ago that <clears throat> are mostly about, I'm going to pour this water because <clears throat> I inhaled something. questions that the sociologists ask are mostly questions about history. Do you think that the United States of America was founded as a Christian nation? Um, they are about uh, people's perception of whether <clears throat> the traditional morality of the United States is being diminished, right? So do, do you think America is getting away from its traditional values? And questions about how people understand the relationship 
between uh, church and state. So do you believe in a separation of church and state, which is uh, fairly fundamental to our form of government uh, as it has been laid out in the United States? And do you believe that the Ten Commandments or that the Bible should be a basis for law? And when sociologists ask people these questions, of course, they don't, they don't ask them with any broader context. And so people bring their own stories, their own understanding to these questions. And uh, you actually get a range of responses. Uh, the sociologists who've measured this for some time say that there are some people who really embrace a, a Christian nationalist narrative in the United States. They call these people ambassadors. So ambassadors of Christian nationalism are people who would enthusiastically embrace this notion that, Christ, that the United States was founded as a Christian nation, that its essential values are found in Scripture, and that, indeed, Scripture should sort of be implemented by law in the United States. <clears throat> but there are lots of people who are not fully uh, uh, on board with that, but who uh, the sociologists call them accommodators. Um, the, the, the two sociologists who've written the most about this, if you want to read more, are Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Uh, they, have, um, they have been following the responses to these questions for some time. And they note some important things, which is that given people's different contexts in the United States, these things can mean very different things. For example, when they survey Americans with these questions, you can get a sort of degree of agreement from most African Americans in the United States because African Americans have a, have a memory of the church. Think, for example, Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., um, uh, uh, you, know, you know, influential ministers who have used scripture to challenge the United States prophetically, right? You're not living up to, you know, uh, uh, God's uh, call that we treat one another equally or that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. This has been used to challenge injustice. And, uh, and someone who, you know, embraces that tradition and recognizes it might respond positively if asked, you know, should the Bible influence public life? They think of Martin King and say, well, sure. You know, he was trying to get the Bible to influence what, but that means something quite different, of course, from someone who believes that uh, uh, their interpretation of uh, sort of, you know, biblical morality should be imposed on any and everyone, whether they share that faith or not. And so uh, the sociologists have recognized for some time that there's something of a range uh, uh, of, of, of response to this, and it varies a bit on context, but on their surveys, they, they have noticed that while this is not a majority position in the United States, particularly among white Protestants in the United States, the number of people who are either ambassadors or accommodators of this white Christian nationalism, as they have identified it, uh, are pretty high. So um, your Baptist brethren, you know, people like me down south, uh, th there's quite a few of folks sort of who live and move in our cultural world who embrace this uh, to some degree. And that's what the sociologists tell us. But I think it's also important to understand this from uh, a sort of social history perspective. So uh, one of our colleagues at Yale University, a guy named Phil Gorski, uh, wrote a book last year with <clears throat> Sam Samuel Perry, who I mentioned earlier. And let me pause one more time, my apologies. And in this book, called The Flag and the Cross, they note that any time there's a sociological phenomenon, any time there's something you can measure that's happening in society, there is a social history to it. And they kind of go back and tell the story. And as it happens, uh, in the United States, there has been, uh, uh, from the very beginning, even from the colonial time, there has been a, a tradition of people using faith to sort of prop up and justify uh, whatever position had power in society. Uh, think, for example, uh, of the, the colonials who were up this way, you know, just, just, just south of you, in uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <clears throat> right? The, uh, 
the Puritans who settled there and who had, you know, power, um, they used a lot of religion to justify the way they wanted to uh, uh, run society, the way they wanted to develop the land and the resources, the way they wanted to displace the indigenous people who were there. And uh, they uh, were often uh, willing to even, uh, uh, if they couldn't impose it directly, to even use violence against uh, uh, their Christian siblings <laughs> who were of different traditions. Uh, and so the Baptists, like Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson and other folks, you know, get, get pushed out by the sort of religious nationalism of that day. And so people like Phil Gorski observed that, that you know, there, there has been a history of a kind of religious nationalism that has been used to prop up particular uh, forms of social order and power that, that, that those who were in charge wanted to, uh, uh, to have an endorsement for. And alongside that, there have always been people of faith who have been resistant to that and who have pushed in the other direction. And um, so if there is this history, I, I wanted to also mention, uh, bring it up a little more to the present. Uh, there's a historian named Anthea Butler who's written on this, who has some very important things to say in particular about how race has played in to the, uh, the way Christian nationalism has been used since the uh, sort of 1970s um, in the United States to, to mobilize a, a, a a group of white voters uh, in the United States who could not as easily organize around their race after the civil rights movement as they had done before. Uh, and I think her, her work is helpful in this way. And there are journalists who have been following the ways that these, um, that, that networks have been built that have pushed this narrative and pushed it into um, uh, communities in a way that uh, th there's a great journalist at uh, Columbia University, a, a woman named Ann Nelson, who wrote a history of an organization called the Council for National Policy. The Council for National Policy was developed um, in the 1970s by a guy named Paul Weyrich. And what Weyrich wanted to do was uh, to really uh, uh, tap into people's religious fervor to push back against the political changes that had happened because of the civil and the women's rights movements in the 60s and early 70s. And um, he, he, he was sort of the architect of uh, gathering that energy and organizing people around religion rather than around a political party or around a, a racial group to say that uh, in the name of your, quote, traditional values, you should uh, show up, you should vote for these people, you should claim power and you should try to impose that on other folks. So this phenomenon, this thing that sort of exploded in our faces that we saw at the Capitol, it has a kind of sociological description, it has a history to it that some people have been narrating, and there are journalists who've been trying to sort of describe uh, how this is, is, is happening and how it's getting to sort of people in the pews, how it's getting to churches. Unfortunately, however, there was very little talk in our country for a long time uh, within the churches <laughs> about the fact that this is something that was happening. Uh, it was happening to us. It was happening among us. Um, uh, in many rooms, there were people um, who were organizing and talking about how our churches could be used to organize uh, these sorts of movements. And yet, uh, there was very little reflection within the church about how this was impacting us, how it was shaping our discipleship in our congregations, and how it was shaping our witness in the world. And this is where um, I've had to come to recognize that I was directly impacted by all of this, even though I didn't understand it. <clears throat> so I was born in 1980 in, uh, in this community that I already mentioned to you, this Baptist church where I grew up, where um, uh, my parents were very eager to have my birth announced, actually on the Sunday after Ronald Reagan had just been elected president uh, th that, that previous Tuesday. So that's when I was born. And um, that's in many ways when the political and social organizations behind this movement were really uh, coming together to, to form uh, 
uh, a kind of movement in the United States. At the time, they called themselves the moral majority. Um, and this, uh, this energy, um, uh, it got directed towards congregations like ours. We were a rural community, uh, mostly white folk, and uh, an all-white Baptist church. And so um, uh, there was a lot of effort to convince our people that uh, our traditional values, uh, our biblical values, meant um, uh, Republican candidates who were reactionary conservatives against everything that had changed in the previous two decades. And I grew up in that uh, as an earnest kid who wanted to do everything I could for Jesus. You know, um, my uh, Sunday school teachers had 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 made us memorize the scriptures. We memorized them in the King James Version. I don't know what y'all were doing up here, but we had the King James Version. We were sticking with it. If it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for us. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be faithful. I wanted to, and, I, and, I, and you know, my people convinced me that, uh, that there's power, there's power in this message. There's power in the gospel. So, it, you know, if you're going to do all you can for Jesus, I really thought I should become president of the United States. I mean, that's what it looked like in that, in that cultural world that was sort of uh, forming at that time. So, uh, so I, I was going to try to do that, and I didn't know how to become president of the United States. Uh, I'm still not sure how, but uh, at the time, it seemed to me that um, I would just follow in the pathway of Jimmy Carter, because he was a Baptist from the South, and he had done it. So uh, he had gone to the uh, um, in the United States, we have a Naval Academy, and uh, that's where he had gotten his start. So I thought I'd, I'd at least start there. And then I realized um, that you have to have a senator's recommendation to even get in the Naval Academy. Um, so I thought, shoot, I mean, I thought that's how I was going to get to know some political people. I don't even know, you know, if you get to know them to get in there, I don't know how. But my grandpa drove a Greyhound bus. And so when we had a snow day once when I was in school, I said, hey, can, can you give me a ride up to Washington, D.C.? You know, he was the member of the family that traveled and got out a bit. So, so he said, yeah, let's go. So we rode to D.C. And um, back then, security not having to be what it is now, you could just go in the Senate. And um, I, I walked in to the upstairs, you know, where you can observe. And I was looking on the floor, and there were young people like me who were running around on the floor of the Senate. And I said to the security guard, I said, who are those people? They're my age. And he said, oh, they're called Senate pages. And I said, oh, how, how do you get that job? And he said, well, you know, you, you can apply and you can be recommended. to." So I got myself appointed to be a page in the U.S. Senate. This was going to be my first step towards, you know, getting to the Naval Academy. And uh, as it happened at the time, the, uh, the senior most member of the Senate was a senator from South Carolina named Strom Thurmond. And so I got placed in Strom Thurmond's office. Uh, now, in 1948, Strom Thurmond was the Dixiecrat candidate for president. Uh, he was as uh, uh, rabid a segregationist as there could have been through the whole civil rights movement. But he uh, really led the Southern Democrats into the Republican Party and uh, got fully on board with this transition of, of organizing people around their race to organizing people around religion and uh, culture. And so... Um, uh, that's whose office I landed in. And here I was with sort of a front seat to what all of this looked like. And it didn't take me very long to realize that there was a bit of a tension between the daily practice of this kind of politics of power and control and the stuff that the, uh, you know, good Baptist Sunday school teachers had taught me that Jesus said. Um, I didn't know exactly why it didn't add up, but I could tell it didn't quite add up. And I, uh, I wasn't sure um, what the alternative to that was, but I, I recognized that it didn't quite fit for me. And so uh, at 16 years old, I, uh, I, I walked away from this movement and from, as I now realize, the organizations that were kind of actively recruiting me into this kind of leadership formation programs uh, for young people of this movement. They're, they're very uh, intentional about these things. They spend a lot of money on, um, educating young people, inviting young people into organizations, you know, giving, giving you a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and really giving people a vision for, uh, for serving this movement for your whole life. And um, uh, I give you my background just to say that um, I now recognize that I was 
I was in it deep there for a minute. I was very much um, uh, asked to be part of it. I attribute to the Holy Spirit, really, the fact that uh, the, the scripture that was within me, uh, the, the faith formation that I had received, the basic discipleship that was offered to me by uh, good people, really, who wanted me to love Jesus, uh, had given me enough to recognize that, that there was a basic discipleship problem here. There is a tension between the way of Jesus and the way that this movement forms us uh, to primarily uh, want not to love and to serve God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but primarily uh, to have power, to have power and control over uh, the society that we live in. And so uh, I, that process... Uh, led me into a, uh, a season of reflection <laughs> that I've uh, been going back to recently because uh, I recognize uh, in the United States and increasingly in conversations around the world that the critical reflection that's happening uh, within churches right now around religious nationalism is something that I really had to come to terms with as a teenager. And when I went home and uh, tried to figure this out, I found it incredibly helpful uh, to learn that there were black Christians in the South. <laughs> I, I met uh, uh, the, the person I still work with uh, today, Reverend William Barber, who was pastoring uh, the Greenleaf Christian Church in um, Goldsboro, North Carolina at the time. And he began to introduce me uh, to a tradition um, it, it wasn't something he had come up with. It's something that he learned from his mama and his daddy and all the folks they worked with and his grandparents. And it, it had been passed down generation to generation. But it was, a, it was a way of being Christian that said that you, your faith means you have to be involved with the world. There's no, there's, no, there's no following Jesus without being engaged with the world. But it doesn't mean you have to be in control. No, no black folks in the South have always known they're not going to be in control. <laughs> No, but, but God has power, and God has, an, has a way that God wants to transform the world. And when we work in the way of Jesus, and when we learn the politics of God, that has the potential to transform the world that is into the world that ought to be. I began to, to learn that tradition, and as I learned it, 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 it gave me an opportunity to reflect on how my own uh, assumptions about faith, and particularly about faith in public life, had been shaped by the religion of the slaveholder more than the religion of Christ. That's a distinction that a man named Frederick Douglass made in the 19th century. Frederick Douglass, who had been enslaved and had been taught Christianity by the people who enslaved him, they said, read this Bible. It says, slaves obey your master. You ought to read that part. <laughs> uh, Douglass, uh, Doug Douglass actually learned to read and uh, recognized that there was a liberating message in this scripture, that the same God who had raised Israel out of Egypt raised Jesus from the dead and uh, could raise him up from his own bondage uh, if he would give the spirit a little bit of help. You know, so he said, I prayed for 20 years for my freedom, and I never got it until I prayed with my feet. <laughs> so he got on out of there, and he got, he got away from the place where he was enslaved. He got up to the north. He joined an AME church, and uh, he began to read the prophets. And if you've never read Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass could preach Jeremiah, let me tell you, because those prophets and what they had to say about the unjust structures of this world, it really rang true to him. And when Douglass wrote his autobiography, uh, he gets to the end, and he says in an appendix, you know, someone who reads this story <clears throat> uh, may assume, because of what I've said about my Christian masters, uh, that I... Uh, don't have anything, uh, I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. And he said, no, no, far from it. He said, between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ, I see the widest possible difference. And uh, he goes on to, to write about what he learned from Jesus, this, uh, this Jesus who uh, hates injustice, this Jesus who can set people free, this Jesus who, who loves and has the power to uh, transform our lives and society. That's, that's the Jesus that he that he loved. And uh, that perspective gave me some resources to begin to reflect on how slaveholder religion had impacted me. And so, um, so I went back and I began to uh, 
read about how the people who had used faith to justify owning other people, how they had thought about that. And uh, even though, you know, we don't make those arguments anymore because uh, in uh, at least uh, uh, our official legal discourse, we haven't had legalized bondage now for some time. Um, the, uh, the, the sort of gymnastics, the mental gymnastics that people went through to explain to themselves why that was, why that was so, uh, I think continue to influence us to this day. I went and I read a Baptist from Virginia. His name was Thornton Stringfellow. He was a pastor. You know, this is a, this is a practical theology gathering we're at here, right? We're talking about pastoral theology. We're talking about how, you know, how do you practice in ministry uh, what, what we reflect on from Scripture and from the doctrine of the church? Well, this is the kind of writer Thornton Stringfellow was. He was a pastor in Virginia. And in the Virginia, where not only slaveholding was allowed by the law, but it was the basis of the economy. And it's important to say in the United States that, uh, that Virginia is not only the place where the legal and social systems of slavery were born, but it's also where white people learned to be white. I don't think we often reflect enough on that side of it uh, as someone who was taught to be white. Uh, when, you know, the first uh, folks from Africa uh, documented in the United States arrived at um, the port of Jamestown in 1619. Y'all probably heard about the 1619 Project. There have been people, you know, for the past couple of years in the United States who have been trying, you know, to, to, to reimagine uh, our own history from the perspective of these, uh, as the record says, uh, 20 and odd Negroes who were sold off a ship there at Jamestown in 1619. When they arrived, uh, there were many people who were working as servants and who were being traded as servants in the colonies at that time. Uh, most people came on some kind of an indenture, right? An agreement that they would, they would be a servant to someone else for a certain amount of time. Um, uh, and there was no clear category to put these folks in that was different from that. Um, and if you go through the Virginia Code, uh, for the next few decades it wasn't clear. As a matter of fact, there are several things that happened that had to clarify it. For example, uh, a few decades later, there was a man uh, of African descent uh, who had married uh, a woman of African descent. She was in bondage at the time, but he had made money, and so he bought her out of bondage. They bought 250 acres of land, and it's not until uh, he tries to leave his land to his children in the Virginia colony that the colony decides that black people can't uh, pass property on. And so they give his property not to his children, but to uh, a white a person of European descent. And you begin to have this distinction between I mean, we, we sort of take this as a given. There are white people and black people, whatever that means. Now, I'm not saying that folks couldn't see, you know, differences in skin tone at the time, but I'm saying there weren't these easy categories that existed to say what those things meant. And, uh, and, and all of this developed in Virginia. And as it developed, if you read the history of Virginia, Virginia Baptists, for example, uh, Baptists in Virginia initially said there's no way under the law of God that you could own another human being. The Baptists got together at a statewide convention in Virginia and said that. And then they went home to their congregations and they realized, the pastors realized, that the local economy had already become so tied to the practice of slavery that the people who paid for their church and who paid their salary were not going to allow them to uh, say that Christianity forbids slavery. So at the next Virginia Baptist Convention, they changed the rules. Uh, it's in the record. All of this sort of came to be in this place. And it's, you know, a century and a half later, but, but Thornton Stringfellow is, is a pastor in Culpeper, Virginia, at this Baptist church, when in the early and mid-19th century, these folks who called themselves abolitionists were using the Bible, of all things, to go around the country and say that this, that this 
practice of owning other people was wrong. People like Frederick Douglass, you know, and, and, and Sojourner Truth, and your people who had experienced it had also linked up with, you know, some folks who, who, who hadn't experienced it but recognized that it was wrong. And the abolitionist was a multiracial movement. There was, there was uh, white folk and black folk working together saying, this is wrong, and because it's wrong, we have to end it, and we have to end it now. We can't just, like the you know, authors of the U.S. Constitution said, you know, end the trade you know, a few decades later and then just let that see what it happens from there. You can't keep kicking it down the road. If it's wrong, it has to end now. That's what the abolitionists were saying. And Stringfellow, as a pastor, in a place that had become entirely accommodated to the economic practice of owning other people, endeavors to explain not only to his congregation, but in a, in a writing that was, that was shared widely with Baptists at the time, he endeavors to explain why it's not only justifiable, but it's good that people who think they're white own people they call black. And here's his reasoning. He says that <clears throat> as he imagines it in God's will, that people who lived in pagan Africa, this is his language, were brought to these shores by good Christian people. And in their uh, enslavement of uh, these pagans, they had shared with them the good news of the gospel. And so Stringfellow says, in our, in an, as an argument for the practice of slavery, that because uh, people who are from Africa had been enslaved and brought to the United States. They had had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Their souls were bound for heaven. And he said there was some hope that one day they might return to Africa and take the good news there. This is his argument. Now, nobody quite makes that argument anymore because nobody's trying to justify slavery. But I don't think you have to, I don't have to spell it out much for you to see how much that has shaped our imagination of missions. Yes? The separation of the soul from the well-being of the body. Oh, my. I heard a lot of that growing up. I still hear a lot of it today. And this notion that the Savior nation, you know, this great so-called Christian nation, is going to carry the gospel to the rest of the world. This man, not only calling himself a preacher, but aiming to teach people all over about the Bible, had evidently not read the Bible itself to see that, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian mix it up right there in the story. The gospel's getting to Africa before the story is over, and he thinks he's going to take it to them or have some enslaved person take it to them 2,000 years later. It's a sort of... Insanity almost. I mean, the, the, uh, from our perspective, it can look crazy. And yet, and yet, I think if we own this as a history, I had to own it as something that had shaped my own personal history. I mean, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. There were Southern Baptist churches because Thornton Stringfellow and others convinced the Baptists of the South to separate from the other Baptists in the United States over this issue. So people not only believed this, but they let it shape the way they understood faith. If you could think that way about how someone else's soul is saved, then you begin to think that way about how your own soul works. And this deep division between what we do with our bodies, how our bodies interact with one another in society, uh, what we are talking about in terms of the public good gets radically divorced from the well-being of souls. It's why, I mean, as, as, as I understand it, uh, Canadian Baptist Ministries today is very committed to integral mission that Brother Rene Padilla taught us about as a response to this kind of very bifurcated Christianity where, you know, the, the well-being of the soul and the mission of the church and its engagement with people in communities and work for justice are two separate things. That's rooted in the kinds of, the kinds of uh, ways we had to split ourselves in two in order to justify owning other people. That's what I learned from Thornton 
Stringfellow, a couple of other folks um, who helped me reflect on this, another Baptist, Thomas Dixon is a man who grew up in North Carolina after the Civil War and after the end of what was called Reconstruction. I'll talk more about this tomorrow. But Reconstruction was, as W.B. Du Bois once said, that brief moment in the sun when uh, the United States experimented for the first time with the full citizenship of uh, people who had been enslaved. And, um, uh, and it was met with a violent backlash uh, by uh, white supremacists who very much called themselves white supremacists at that time. There was no effort to, uh, to, to, to hide that. And yet they also understood it to be very much tied to their faith. And historians of that period when Thomas Dixon was born and, and after which he grew up in North Carolina, call that time period the redemption period in uh, uh, US history, the end of reconstruction and the rise of the Jim Crow South. Uh, because the people who, the white people who took control and who violently stripped power from African Americans in the South, they used theological language. They said what they were doing was redeeming their country from outside agitators and from uh, what they called Negro rule. Well, Dixon grew up in the midst of that and became a Baptist preacher and a politician in North Carolina, uh, but he was much more successful as a preacher. And so uh, after a short stint in the state legislature, uh, he made his way to New York City and started what I think uh, by some accounts would be one of the first mega churches in the United States. He started it in a theater in New York City and became very popular uh, evangelical style preacher from the South. In some ways, he foreshadowed someone like Billy Graham, you know, who would come on later. Um, but he became very popular in that church in New York, so popular, in fact, that um, he left the church and went on the Chautauqua circuit, which was what we had in the United States back then before television and things, you know, al allowed you to, s it's, it's how you got around all the cities and, and uh, gave your talks. And in his case, sold books. Uh, he wrote fiction books. And uh, one of his most famous uh, was a book called The Klansman. And in The Klansman, he sort of fictionalized his uncle, uh, who had been uh, a, a Confederate uh, general and had uh, led troops in the war, and who he thought had been much maligned by you know, the, 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 the Northerners who thought that you know, the defeat of the South was a great moral victory. And uh, he wanted to set the record straight. And so he tells this story in, um, in uh, an incredibly racist story that has all these tropes that come down to us, all, you know, all down to today. I mean, you know, the, the tropes of fear and uh, the, the, the notion that, you know, if black folks had any political power, then they would, <clears throat> then they would rape the white women and they would, you know, uh, I mean, it was, it was, it, it's, it's almost grotesque in the presentation of it. It is grotesque, and yet, uh, uh, he writes this, you know, in a way that, uh, of course, lots of northern people criticized it, but it was wildly popular in the South. It gets turned into a stage play that millions of people in the South saw. And then a guy named D.W. Griffiths in California uh, decided to turn it into a movie. And the story uh, gets, gets uh, turned into the film, The Birth of a Nation. And it just so happens that uh, Thomas Dixon was uh, college buddies uh, at Johns Hopkins with Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson had just gone from being president of Princeton University to being president of the United States. And he invites his old buddy, uh, Tom Dixon, to the White House. And so the first film that gets shown in the White House in the United States is this piece of racist propaganda, The Birth of a Nation, written by a Baptist preacher from North Carolina, who is telling a story in his mind that is about redeeming the country and using political power to impose moral values. Uh, that's how he narrates the end of Reconstruction and the beginning of the Jim Crow South. <clears throat> and learning that gave me sort of different ears to understand what was happening when uh, I got invited into these organizations that told me about how the, uh, the country's values began to slip 
And you'd ask, when did they begin to slip? And they'd say, sometime around the Brown versus Board of Education decision. They didn't say it quite like that, but that, you know, sometime in the 50s. Sometime in the 50s when things started getting desegregated, when people started um, uh, questioning the social order of the South, we began to lose our morality. We began to lose our values. In many ways, that very explicitly racist story that Thomas Dixon told and that got turned into a, a movie and used as a recruiting tool for the Ku Klux Klan in the mid-20th century, it gets told again, told again after the Civil Rights Movement, but as a story that is all about religion and tries not to be racist. Uh, and the third character, I think, uh, in terms of Baptist preachers, who I think uh, you can see playing this out, is Jerry Falwell of Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, Jerry Falwell, who by his own account was a fundamentalist, biblical preacher who didn't want to get involved in politics until. What was the impetus? He would later say the impetus was his concern for life. But if you go back and look at the record, and this is the historical work that Anthea Butler does in her, in, uh, in her book on this, uh, on, on white evangelicalism, he really gets politically engaged after the Brown decision, right? After the Supreme Court of the United States agrees with the legal arguments that, that have been made that say segregation is hurting everyone. Therefore, the federal government is going to take action to desegregate our schools. And the mass hysteria that resulted from this uh, across the South took a particular form in the state of Virginia that we've talked about already some, that state of Virginia that has such history. In that state, the governor said, we're going to have massive resistance, which is to say, we're going to tell the federal government we would rather shut down our schools than desegregate them. And they began to organize on the local level how to do that. They, they organized through what they called state sovereignty committees. And when the State Sovereignty Committee met in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1955, Jerry Falwell showed up and volunteered to be the chaplain for the, his local, so that was his introduction to political life. And so when Paul Weyrich comes along 15 years later uh, to begin to uh, uh, talk to him and others like him about how white Christians in the South can, can uh, reclaim values, can support traditional family values, can make sure that their, that their private academies that they had started in their churches. Now think about this. At the moment when the public schools that everybody went to started to desegregate by federal mandate, the white churches started private academies where they would send their children so as to not send them to the public schools but to have them in these places where they would instill in them again, their language, traditional family values. Uh, Falwell was very ready uh, to take on this charge and to give it the, uh, 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 the rather more uh, uh, um, appealing to a PR firm name, uh, pro-life, rather than uh, what Dixon and his, uh, his era had explicitly called white supremacy. But the but the echoes of the kind of morality and the kind of uh, a claim that we can use power to impose morality on other people is there and there all along. So these are the examples. Uh, folks like Stringfellow, Dixon, and Falwell, who began to help me see how a way of being Christian that I was being discipled into was actually something that was quite anti-Christian and anti the spirit of Christ, but, but being uh, pushed on my community in the name of Jesus. And this, I believe, is uh, not simply an issue for Southern Baptists in the South, or even for uh, Americans, where these movements have had uh, incredible influence over the last four decades. But increasingly, there is a global movement 
Um, of the organizations, uh, I mentioned earlier this Council for National Policy. I mean, there, there are high level attempts to knit together money, media, uh, 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 academic and intellectual uh, reflection that justifies a lot of this, and religious organizations in order to push this uh, way of understanding faith in public life for the purpose, they would always say, for the purpose of defending values and defending morality. But I think it's very clear uh, that it's for the purpose of promoting a particular political and economic agenda. And so while our contexts are quite different between the United States and Canada, and our governments work quite differently, what I want you to know is that the organizations that want to use Christian faith in order to promote this cultural and political movement for the sake of power are very much focused on you and your churches as well. And all of the ways that this can not only impact our public witness, but also our discipleship, our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to practice Christian faith in our communities uh, are being impacted because the reach of these organizations is so, or it's just so huge. Um, the, the publishing arms of them, the, the degree to which you know, they're present on the internet, that anybody who gets on YouTube and starts watching Christian videos, uh, are, they're going to get simply, the, there's, the, the, Ann Nelson says it like this, the woman who wrote the book on the Council for National Policy. She says that these organizations have spent their money to strategically create what she calls a wraparound culture. And the point of the wraparound culture is to take something that if I came and told you about your faith, you would call me crazy. But if you hear it on the radio station you listen to, and you hear it on a news station that you watch, and you read it in a free pamphlet that you get in the mail, and then maybe you know somebody comes to your church and says something uh, about this, it begins to sound sort of normal. And the fact of the matter is, in places where this has become the dominant culture, I mean, folks, folks here in Canada ask me all the time, how in the world do people believe the craziness? You know, if you just hear Donald Trump on TV, he, the man sounds mad. You ask yourself, how could anybody ever believe that? But if you go to a rural community in North Carolina where I live, and the local pastor says it, and the Christian radio station says it, and the politicians say it, and the, you know, half the school board says it's true, you begin to think, well, maybe there is something to this. So I think the, the power of this wraparound culture and the capacity of sort of repeating a message to invite people, you know, into an almost alternate, alternate reality uh, is something that we have to pay attention to. And as Christians, have to pay attention to the way that it is impacting our faith. Not, not just the way other people see our faith, but the way our faith is actually being practiced by people in our congregations. I cannot tell you in the United States since January 6th how many pastors I've walked through this stuff with who have then said to me, well, you know, I did have a parishioner come to me and say, what should I do? My husband was at the Capitol. What should I do? You know, my uncle was there. Uh, I watched his Facebook live stream. <laughs> you know, he live streamed it all the way through the Capitol. Um, it's, it's something that is... And so I, I, will, I will wrap up here for tonight. I know that all of this can feel incredibly overwhelming. I know it because I've lived it. And because I've had this conversation with people who very much live in this wraparound culture every day. And so... As a person of faith, I've spent a good bit of time praying and asking Jesus, how in the world did we ever get here? And what is somebody like me or what are any of us supposed to do if we recognize that this is happening? And the more I have prayed in that vein, the more I've been drawn to the Gospels. And in the Gospels, I recognize this. 
I didn't I never saw it before before I before I went back and took seriously how all this had impacted me I'd never noticed this but Jesus is actually challenging religious nationalism a lot all through the Gospels right who does Jesus get the maddest at he gets the maddest at the religious leaders who are in cahoots with the people in power and who are using that power to hurt vulnerable people Jesus in that way is like all the prophets right he's ready to rage he's ready to go in there in the temple and turn over the tables because why the religious leaders are using their religious power in collaboration with the political powers to exploit the poor and that makes Jesus very mad and Jesus actually has a way to take this on that is Jesus leads a poor people's march into Jerusalem we call it Palm Sunday and all the people who've been marginalized and 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 hurt by this regime that's been propped up by this religious leaders they welcome Jesus in and welcome in this very different way of understanding what God has been up to all along and they say hail Jesus he's our king yes the man on the donkey not the man with his face on the coin the man on the donkey he's our king and he is going to show he's going to lead us into another way so all that to say uh, this is a heavy lecture to start with there's a lot more hope in the next two but I want to conclude with the gospel because I really do believe that the resources that are needed to address a challenge like this are right there in our faith they have been given to us and as much as others have tried to twist that and misuse it and abuse it the 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 power is still there and so if you will stay with me both you who are here and you who are online, if you'll stay with me for the next two days, what I would like to do is go with you into the history of those who have resisted all along to learn some, to learn something from those people. And, 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 and I'm going I'm to offer you this tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a bridge between Nova Scotia and North Carolina as just a way of, of, of showing how the Spirit has already been working between these two places to make that possible. Uh, this was in the middle of the 19th century. Somebody who, who was in both of these places uh, was showing us another way. We're going to look at the history of that and then finally look at what moral fusion movements for the common good can look like today. So that's where we're going. But I wanted to begin by saying we are in a mess. And we're in a mess that's being, that's being carried out in our name and in the name of our faith. And so I think we have to look honestly at it and we have to begin there if we're going to uh, uh, really embrace the possibility of a public faith for the common good. So thank you. I'll stop there and uh, hand this over to Stuart. Okay, thank you very much. Jonathan's going to stay here and uh, we will take questions. They tell me this microphone works so you can give that one to anybody. Okay, yeah, yeah. so I'm running out if anyone uh, has a question in the room that they, they want to follow up. I, so I had a question, but I'll, I'll save it because it may be more coming in the next two okay. nights, but, but we might get there, we'll see. So anyone in the room, first of all, who might, who might want to ask a question around some of the analysis, some of the claims Jonathan has been making, either for clarity or in order to say, well, I'm not quite sure, what did you mean by that? Yeah, okay. I just want a clarity question. Okay, well, here, you need to use your microphone so that others can hear, if that's okay, okay? I do come with a different accent, so, you know, anything that's not clear is understandable, so please, yes. No, I just missed a name. Who's the name of the person who talks about wraparound culture? Mm. Her name is Ann Nelson, A-N-N-E. Ann with an E, like up here at Cape Breton. Uh, that Ann, Ann Nelson. Um, she wrote a book called The Shadow Network and has been a very good investigative journalist, particularly looking at the influence of the Council for National Policy, which is the coordinating organization that Paul Weyrich started in order to build a network that could um, use this minority position. I think it's important to say this is a minority position. I mean, it, Theologically, it's certainly a minority position, but also in churches. If you survey people, people, a majority of people do not believe this in the United States. And yet, as a movement, it has had a disproportionate influence on our public life. And so it's a very fair question to ask, how does that happen? And that's really the question she asks. And it happens through organization. 
and she she has tracked those organizations as an investigative journalist. She's at the journalism school at Columbia University, which is really our best journalism school in the United States. She's a wonderful scholar, and um, and that book brings her research together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will say just before I go, there's another great journalist who has paid attention in the past few years, in particular, to how those same organizations are uh, have designs to uh, have a similar influence here in Canada and in Europe. Her name is Catherine Stewart. And so uh, I think it's important, like if you look at, for example, the Orban regime right now in, uh, in uh, Hungary, there are very similar, actually some of the same organizations have uh, connected with that political movement and have helped uh, give it power. And uh, she has traced a lot of that. Catherine Stewart is her name. She has a book, her most recent book is called The Power Worshippers. And it chronicles uh, much of the organizational work that's happening in, in that sphere. Hi, um, thank you very much for your, for your lectures. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the wrap around culture. You said, okay, there's all these crazy things that if we repeat enough time that yeah. everybody will believe in that. Yeah. A little bit pushback, I think there must be, there always lies, is, uh, good lies is a half true. Yeah. So there are some truth, some grievance, or some in the in the in the in the in in the in the south and in the rural area. Which, uh, yeah. That that is this crazy thing is addressed. Yeah. And and uh, so how you repeal those half truth? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I think you're absolutely right that um, the organizing behind what I've tried to sketch here uh, aims to exploit a particular vulnerability. And um, this is a vulnerability that is shared in much of the world, so I think it's worth uh, naming. Um, um, I think the easiest way to, to name it is to say that uh, in the global economy, economists have told us for some time that there is um, a growing inequality, right? Um, I know the particular history of that in the United States better than I know it here, but I know it's real here, right? You, you have growing inequality in Canada. Uh, we have growing inequality in Europe. Um, it's very real in South America. It's very real in Asia. Um, and it has a lot to do with the dominant economic order, which economists call neoliberalism, uh, but which I think, um, and, and this is part of why I think the U.S. history is actually, uh, I'm not trying to be American-centric here to say that the, Europe, the, the American history is important. I actually think what we now call the global economy is actually fundamentally a plantation economy. And I say that partly because the uh, arguments that the economists made for the neoliberal order that we live in today were largely based on um, ideas about liberty that were developed by slaveholders. Uh, there's a woman named Nancy McLean who wrote a book called Democracy in Chains. And uh, she uh, traces the career. She actually <laughs> sort of stumbled into the papers of a guy named James Buchanan, who was one of the founders of the sort of neoliberal economics. She, she got access to his papers without sort of everybody realizing she had access to his papers. So she got to kind of read all the meetings that happened and all of the conversations that people had about how you argue, basically, that it's best to give corporations complete freedom to do whatever they want and to exploit people and resources in any way they want. That's best for the economy, right? Which is essentially the argument that neoliberals made. And that whatever potential uh, social ills that might create will be addressed by a growing economy, right? This is the, you've heard this argument. It, it sort of comes out in different ways. But the, but, the, but the idea is always that if the economy grows, it'll be good for everyone. And therefore, you don't have to in any way restrain or regulate the people who have power, the people who have money. You, you just let the market work. Um, 
neoliberalism essentially said, you know, hands off is best. And Buchanan was one of the guys, well, anyway, McLean in her book, Democracy and Chains, she goes through his papers and through all of the conversations and you know, global meetings that were had, uh, and, and then the way that that influenced the reorganization of economies, like the economy of Argentina was actually reorganized by the people in this group. And, um, and, and th all throughout, they're reading James Calhoun, who was the U.S. Senator from South Carolina, who Strom Thurmond, who I mentioned later, would later you know, fill his seat, but, but he was the Senator from South Carolina before the Civil War, who argued in the Senate that slaveholders had to be free to do whatever they wanted with their property because otherwise the economy was gonna crash. That was his whole argument. So anyway, she, she really, in a, in a robust scholarly way, makes the connection between the slaveholder economy of the 19th century and today's neoliberalism. And I think um, if you sort of zoom out from there, to answer your question, the inequality age that we're living in around the world is largely a result of those economic theories and the way they've been embraced by governments all over the world. Well, if that's the case, then I think it's, it's also uh, important to note that when there's growing inequality, people who have a memory of themselves or their families doing better and now can see that they're doing worse reasonably ask why. You know, why can't I get a job as good as the union job that my daddy had? People in the South ask that a lot. And what uh, many of these movements that I've described uh, have, have, have done is they've developed what are usually called cultural wedge issues in order to blame somebody else for the problem. So as crazy as it sounds, in, the, in, in North Carolina where I'm from today, <clears throat> Republican politicians have actually gotten pretty good at telling white folks who are pretty poor, or at least not doing as well as their parents did, that they're poor because of the gay people. Now, by itself, that argument probably wouldn't work, but if you, again, if you have that whole wraparound culture, and if you can kind of you know, shape it in such a way that by sort of distracting people with this group or that group to blame, and then saying, we're going to make things right again by restoring your traditional values, it's kind of the logic of how the argument works. So I don't in any way want to suggest that the people who you know, have been on the receiving end of this are ignorant or backwards or dumb. I don't think they are. I think they've been given a set of choices that lead them to you know, make assumptions that often, you know, often they, these cultural wedge issues, choose, they choose issues that people don't know much about, like they don't have much experience with and then try to use that to pit people against one another. So fear and division you know, is an old pattern. I think it takes new forms, but I think that's the tactic that's associated with this particular strategy and that it's, it's playing on the vulnerability of, uh, of people who are living in an inequality age. And that's very real, right? Which is why any Christian attempt to offer hope that's real in the world has to be real economic hope, right? We, you know, the good news of Jesus needs to be something about God. What, what is God's economy? You know, we, we worship a guy who pulled coins out of fish's mouths. We got to make that real. You know, <laughs> for people who can't feed their children, we got to figure out how to make that real. And I think that's a, that, that's a great challenge that we face in terms of, of, of meeting this, this threat of Christian nationalism. Thank you for asking. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll come up there in a moment. I'll sit in here first, and you might have to keep putting your hands up because I'll forget who I saw. I was just wondering about your perspective of the 22 midterms and Trump losing the 2020 election. Is that a source of hope for you? That as horrible as Trump's hold is on the Republican Party, that his hold on the country as a whole may begin to wane? And I'm wondering how you feel about how his hold is on the evangelical church now compared to when he ran for president in 2016. Yeah, no, these are good questions. And um, 
I don't have all the answers. It is, it is clear to me that some people who were persuaded by these messages have been, thank you, exposed to them enough now that they have their doubts. Um, it's also clear to me that the Republican Party in the United States recognizes the person of Donald Trump as a, at least a potential vulnerability. And so there are many people who may have the same aims who've just decided that he's probably not the best vehicle uh, for achieving those aims. Um, that's politics and it's messy. And so uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't foretell any particular conclusion, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, it, it's very possible, given uh, the narratives that I've described and the way that they have been able to mobilize people, that, um, that they could be directed behind another candidate who could do even more damage in terms of policy, right? In terms of the, in terms of the political agenda of stripping all regulation from you know, people who have money and uh, taking away any capacity that we have to care for one another through you know, the sh shared life that a government makes possible. That's possible. It is also possible, uh, and, and this is where I invest my energies in the United States, that people who have uh, seen this and seen it in such a sort of um, raw and exposed form um, could embrace a different kind of uh, political vision. And so that's what I'm gonna talk more about tomorrow, what that looks like in the United States right, right now, and, and actually even more on Thursday. But, but um, I guess I, um, I hold on to hope, recognizing that both things are possible. Okay, thank you. Now the hands up here. Oh, there's a few hands up here. Lots of them. I'm just going to stay up this end of the room then for a bit. Yeah. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your perspectives and uh, the obvious work you've done to uh, uh, garner all the knowledge that you that that you seem like you know is vital that we that we hear. It's good. It's good. Now I just wanted if you speak for a moment about media, yeah. um, like Fox. Yeah. Etc. Uh, and and oh, here in this country we have a national news source. Yeah. But you know, I think that there are like what would you say, influences that are maybe, you know, irrefutably, uh, you know, affecting what everyone hears every yeah. day. Yeah. You know, in, in in ways. And how can you trust what people are telling you on the radio or television or where? Yeah. You know, it's not like the internet, is it? Or is it? I don't know. Thank you. The question about media is important. Um, I'll say that in the uh, current organizational nexus that I've sort of referenced, but di didn't have time to go into all the details of, um, media is a, is a huge sector where organizing has happened around this. Fox News has been part of that but certainly not alone. Um, at the same organizing table with the executives of Fox News for decades now has been the executives of American Family Radio, which is a Christian radio network in the United States, another independent radio network called Bot Radio, and some, um, some sort of parent companies that people don't know the names of, but who have bought up local newspaper and television stations. And um, in all of that, um, the effort has been to um, use the kind of American mid 20th century notion of, um, of balanced perspective by covering both sides to use that to legitimate extreme positions, right? So if, you know, the um, uh, mainstream position is this, then you say, well, that's only one side. And you get, you know, the, what might sound uh, just absolutely ludicrous on, uh, you know, to, to, to a, uh, especially, you know, to, I'm, I'm just thinking, y'all are living in Canada. Like, if, you've, if you just, like, haven't been immersed in this, I mean, you'd hear some of these things and think, that's the other side? Like, that sounds like something that came out of, 
just left field, but, but you know, that's, that's been the, a, an intentional st strategy to create um, uh, media in which uh, a reactionary extreme position becomes the other side to whatever uh, a, a kind of mainstream position was before. The other thing I'd say in terms of this uh, media question is that um, one thing, one tactic that this movement has used consistently is um, to develop a base, develop trust with a base for whom they can then delegitimize other forms of authority. Uh, and, and they've done this in various ways, but, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's been a consistent tactic. And so um, I would think, for example, in, the, in Canada, um, a movement like this recognizes that it could never supplant the CBC. It's never going to have a sort of, you know, media arm that is, that has an equivalent, you know, reporting force or that has an equivalent uh, listener base. But if with their base, they can delegitimize that or delegitimize the universities or delegitimize any, any sort of recognized centers of authority, um, that helps them. And it helps them build a narrative where they are telling people, you can't trust anyone but us. Um, so that's been pretty consistent. It's, it's uh, certainly been the case in the States and, and I see it happening in other places around the world. And it's often done through media. Um, there's been some interesting research just since the pandemic on um, uh, just the way that YouTube and YouTube's algorithm has shaped, uh, you know, young people who, not just young people, but often young people have used YouTube as a sort of, you know, I mean, like, like I used to turn on the TV when I was a kid at home and see what was on, and people will get on YouTube and and. Um, Apparently, there, I mean, there have been several studies where people have sort of increasingly uh, fallen deeper into the rabbit hole of, of uh, what I think can legitimately be called conspiracy theories, but simply through, you know, this kind of um, a form of media that will continue to repeat the same kind of story from different sources, because right? that's just how the algorithm works. So um, I think it's important to pay attention to all those things. I wonder if you might comment on the book uh, Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Dumais. Yes, um, so Kristen Dumais is a uh, wonderful scholar, historian at Calvin University. And um, yes, yeah, she, um, uh, she has told a, a, a version of this story um, that, that I've, I've tried to summarize for you, but from the particular perspective of the way that a form of masculinity was tied to this, um, this vision of power and control. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, every Baptist preacher who I mentioned tonight in that sort of uh, chronology of how slaveholder religion developed over time, uh, she would also have a way of reading them into the story of Jesus and John Wayne. John Wayne here just being, um, you know, the American cowboy uh, from the movies who embodied this uh, form of masculinity and power and control um, and values that, um, uh, that a segment of white evangelicalism in the United States embraced as, um, as true traditional values. Um, so I think her story is very important, in particular in the way that it um, exposes the role that gender and gender identity has played in this. Um, she's an incredibly good scholar, and um, uh, I will say that she has also, since publishing that book, been, um, I think, doing very important work to, um, to try to identify uh, what sort of, uh, shared commitments and, and uh, shared narratives are essential to democracy. Um, I think she, she recognizes that, you know, there are people for whom, um, I mean, you know, if you talk about morality and values, these things obviously mean a lot to people. And I've 
lived in a different enough different communities to know that they also vary quite a bit. I mean, they're, it's shaped by a lot of things. It's shaped by culture. It's shaped by, you know, your uh, family stories and what people have been exposed to. And uh, you know, it's so. So she she recognizes that there there are people who might land in a range of places on those issues, but if 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 a pretty broad sector of those people can't agree to some basic rules of, of, of democratic life, then uh, there's not much hope of holding on to democracy when there's a movement that's trying to mobilize a sort of reactionary force within that conversation to really take over and to, uh, and uh, you know, she's paying attention to research here that the, I didn't talk about this research, but there's been research by many of the same sociologists I was talking about who describe white Christian nationalism that, uh, that makes it pretty clear that there is a majority of uh, white Christians in the United States who, um, who are uh, willing to um, uh, forego the normalities of the democratic process in order to hold on to this narrative. Um, yeah, I mean, questions like, uh, do you believe it may be necessary to take up arms in order to uh, defend your vision of what this country should be? Uh, there are segments of um, the Christian community in the United States where a majority of people now say yes. Um, and that's, that's pretty alarming. So uh, all that to say, I appreciate the work she's doing to try to identify a kind of broad center where people could maintain a commitment to to democracy and to you know working out uh, differences that people have about you know all kinds of things in terms of how we live, but to continue to live uh, peaceably together in a place and and to even believe that we can you know take care of one another's basic needs and you know educate one another's children and those kind of things. Okay, we're going to finish with just one more question. I think it was over here. Last question, you. Thank you for your excellent talk. I heard you mention the moral majority, and so I'm interested in um, looking at the religious right in Christian coalition moral majority in the yeah. 80s and 90s, yeah. and I wonder your thoughts on the historical relationship of that to Christian nationalism a la January 6th. Is yes. this the same movement? Is this one that influences the other? Is this something different, but they have similarities? How? What's the historical development there? Thank you. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it is, um, it is that movement grown up in the sense that the organizations and the um, um, narratives and the money, that the, the, those three things that were behind those things have responded to changes in the United States and have become I think what is now described as white Christian nationalism. Um, and in some ways, of course, the, you know, the, the basics of what I've been trying to sketch have been there all along. Um, so I would have called it white Christian nationalism then as well. But, I, but I'm just saying in terms of what you see today, uh, I think it's a, it is a kind of a genealogical progression of that. Um, and of people within those circles deciding that the power to control is more important than any sort of hesitancy they had about these tactics. Um, I'll say one other thing I've learned from the sociologist. Robert Jones is another sociologist who uh, pays attention to these things, and one of the things he notes that has changed in this time period, it happened actually during Barack Obama's presidency, and I think that's significant, is that white Christians in America became a minority for the first time. Um, so part of the reality, I think, of living <clears throat> at the center of a plantation economy that has never really repented of the basic structure of that, but has continued on, is that um, Americans always live, and to some extent I think the global economy always lives, with an assumption of racism. Like there's just an assumption of white supremacy that's there. And I think America has been able as a country to maintain uh, 
both a functional white supremacy and a belief that it's a democracy because it has been major a majority white country. Uh, well, white Christians became a minority, or one among many minorities, in, um, during Barack Obama's presidency. And I think our dem demographers say that white people in general will become uh, one among many minorities around 2040 in the United States. Um, so I think that is creating a sort of tension in this narrative, right? So p people who've been able to sort of assume white supremacy, but we're a democracy, we get along, you know. Um, I think that's coming to a head. And so I think, I think there, um, there are real decisions that are being made about whether um, people can share power or not. These organizations behind this movement that I've been sketching, they have made their decision. They do not want it and they do not believe it's possible. And they are willing to do almost anything from what I've seen to hold on to power as a minority. I think that much is clear. I think the question that that poses for uh, Christians is, uh, well, if we didn't even realize that this was a choice in our various contexts, you know, what choices are we willing to make now that it's clear that uh, uh, maybe this democratic experience experiment has never even really been authentic. So are we willing to do the work it would take to make it real? Or are these folks going to decide our future? I think that's the decision before us, um, which is why uh, I wanted to take the time to sketch this rather uh, gloomy reality because, um, because for some people, it was never possible to ignore it. And maybe uh, the most important thing for somebody like me who has been able to live in the illusion that they're white for all of their life, maybe the most important thing for somebody like me is to just say, um, the world is not as I thought it was. And I need to relearn. I need to learn from somebody else what's possible. Which is what we want to turn to tomorrow evening. So I hope you'll come back. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you. Thank you. So we appreciate you being with us very much tonight, providing an analysis, pulling names out of the hat and quotations and statistics and quoting books. I'm impressed by this. <laughs> but thank you for doing that and trying to unpack a whole area that's very complex and setting that up for the next couple of evenings and also for taking the time to respond to the different questions in the room. I'm sorry if you raised your hand and I didn't see you. I encourage you tomorrow to be very charismatic in the way in which you want to communicate if you're going to raise your hands. Or to sit in the front. Yeah, it's, it's all open. Them high. <laughs> and uh, we thank you for the folk who have also been joining us online. Uh, tomorrow we will be gathering here. So tomorrow the events during the day will focus very much around what Jonathan is presenting to us through his lectures and the Simpson lectures. So at 10.30 tomorrow in here we have a worship service. That will be followed by a brunch. That is going to be followed by, is it a couch or a sofa? I never get it right. Sofa? <laughs> the red sofa conversation where you have an interview with Dr. Robbins. That will be followed by a seminar in the afternoon. But the trouble over here, we have some doctor and ministry students. My apologies. The, the, feeling pretty familiar over here in the corner, you can see. Uh, uh, tomorrow we have another of our doctor and ministry students from a previous time will be presenting along with me on something on rhetoric and the common good. And then, is that all tomorrow? No, 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 there's more tomorrow. There's then more. we come back here. We come back here for the lecture in the evening and then it's followed by the kitchen party, which will be over in the Irving Centre. If you can remember all of that, you're doing really well. You probably would remember all of that. I'm struggling. You can find it on the website if you want to check what is happening and where it's happening. So we thank you for coming tonight. We hope that you go in grace and you go in peace. And uh, we hope we get a chance to gather again to continue to think through these different ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.